Good day, everybody, and welcome to the second of the 2018 winter webinars from the Sir James Dunn Animal Welfare Center at the Atlantic Veterinary College in Prince Edward Island, Canada. I'm Dr. Alice Crook, coordinator of the center, and I'm excited that we have registrants from all over the world this year, Canada and the US, several European countries, Australia, New Zealand, the Caribbean, and South America. I want to extend a particular welcome to all the ABC alumni in the audience and also to the many vet students and animal health technician students from many different schools. Welcome to everybody. Before I introduce our presenter, I'm going to go over a few things so you'll know how to participate in today's event. First, it's a good idea to close all unnecessary programs or apps running on your computer. We've taken a screenshot to show you what we'll, you will see on your own computer desktop. Taking up most of the screen is the GoToWebinar viewer through which you will see the presentation. In the upper right is the GoToWebinar control panel where you can choose the audio mode and where you can ask questions. By default, you're listening in using your computer's speaker system. If you would prefer to listen over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Your control panel will collapse automatically when not in use. To keep it open, you can click on the View menu and uncheck Auto Hide Control Panel. Here's a closer look at the control panel and how you can participate. You've all joined the webinar in listen-only mode, which means you are muted. However, we welcome your questions or comments, which you can submit by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel. You can send them in at any point. We'll collect them and Dr. Overall will address them at the end of today's presentation. Note also that today's presentation is being recorded and will be sent to you in a follow-up email from GoToWebinar within a few days. Veterinarians and veterinary technicians will receive a CE certificate within um, a couple of weeks of the last webinar they attend. So now it's my very great pleasure to introduce to you um, Dr. Overall. And I see that on this slide that you're seeing, it's, it's still listing the title of last week's webinar. But I assure you that she's going to give this week's <laughs> webinar. Um, so Dr. Overall has given hundreds of national and international presentations and short courses and is the author of over 100 scholarly publications, dozens of textbook chapters, and the text Clinical Behavioral Medicine for Small Animals and the Manual of Clinical Behavioral Medicine for Dogs and Cats as well as of the DVD, Humane Behavioral Care for Dogs, Problem Prevention and Treatment. She is the Editor-in-Chief for the Journal of Veterinary Behavior, Clinical Applications and Research. Dr. Overall is a Senior Research Scientist in the Biology Department at the University of Pennsylvania, where she studies the effects of anxiety and reactivity on performance and mental health in dogs. And now I'm going to switch over to your screen, Karen. Excellent, thank you, Alice. Perfect. Can you see that? Yeah, that yeah. looks great. Excellent. So welcome, everybody. These are actually um, my three dogs, and they are playing in the Northumberland Strait off, interestingly, the coast of Prince Edward Island. So absolutely wonderful, wonderful place for them to um, spend time in the water. Okay, today we're going to talk about behavioral and neurodevelopment in puppies, what you have to know to give them the best start and to minimize risk. And we're going to do this for those of you who listened to last week's webinar in the same way we did it for cats. So it's a very dense presentation. You will be able to view and listen to it again. You do have a handout of the slides. But what I want to do is give you a flavor of a couple of things. First, um, a flavor to share my passion in this field and for the uh, huge interventions that we actually can make for dogs. We don't think of this, but there is a, a huge amount of preventative work we can do to ensure that puppies and kittens have the best start, even if they didn't actually start out that way. So I wanna give you a passion for, for approaching these animals and looking out for their mental health and their well-being and their welfare. And the other thing I wanna do is give you a feeling for the field. And this is a field that is becoming emergent because people are more and more interested in dogs as development models. Um, for human conditions because they 
develop the same types of pathologies that we develop in human psychiatry, and because they share our lives with us in a very different way than cats do. So the presentation is dense. I'm going to pick and choose things from the slides to emphasize, but I, I think you'll get a flavor for how it all comes together as we progress. And please make sure you note your questions. If I'm confusing or it wasn't clear, or there's some other information you want. Um, if I can provide it, I certainly shall do so. So the outline matches that for cats. We're going to talk about the evolutionary history of dogs. It's a very, very, very different evolutionary history than we discussed for cats. We're going to talk about sensitive periods in neurobehavioral development. And again, you will see a very different pattern than we have with cats. Again, alluding to the fact that dogs were developed in a cooperative effort for work, whereas cats basically followed agriculture and came along to live with us because it suited them. Uh, epigenetic effects on early development, another subject we're going to discuss. Roles for temperament, and this time we're really going to focus a lot more on the boldness shyness continuum because it's been fairly well worked out for dogs in a couple of um, restricted circumstances. And I say that because this is yet another case of where you have to define your terms and then apply them um, only in the contexts that are discussed. Uh, we'll review what social maturity is and emphasize the differences in dogs compared with cats. We'll talk about how we minimize risks for this very different species and how we meet their needs. I'm going to uh, throw a little bit of a wrench in the system by talking about a window into adult risk if we fail that probably no one will be anticipating. Um, but it's important and it's something that has been driven home to me by my own research recently. And then we're going to wrap up with a couple of uh, summary conclusions and some things that we should do if we want to do things as well as uh, they can be done. Okay, so let's discuss the evolutionary history of dogs first. First of all, let me say that dogs and wolves have been separate species for a very long time. The story of dogs is the story of true collaborative work with humans. Now, why am I making this point that they're separate species? Because so much of the mythology about how we should treat pet dogs, especially the parts that are abusive, where people want you to dominate pet dogs and do horrible things to them, come from a misapprehension that these are very much like wild animals. And I need to say most of those concepts don't actually apply to wolves. They may have some weak application to some wolves in some zoos, but I would be very, very careful about oversimplifying what is an incredibly complex evolutionary history and thinking that because you're Canis lupus, whether you're Canis lupus familiaris or Canis lupus lupus, that you're the same individual, this would be a, an enormous mistake. And yet it's made every day. So let me talk about the modern dog and in some form, and notice that I say in some form, this is a restricted term, in some form, modern dogs have probably been around as long as and along with modern humans. Now you need to know, modern humans as we are now have only been around for 60,000 years. So for um, most of that, if not all of it, dogs were beginning to become dogs. And certainly for, if you want to be on the conservative side, 15,000 years, and I have to tell you, I think this is too conservative, or more likely 30,000 plus years, and I'm going to show you some data that support this, there's evidence of true collaborative work with true extant modern dogs as a species or a set of groups of individuals belonging to the same species, separate from that of wolves. And there are now multiple lines of evidence that these modern dogs were established at least 30,000 years before present. Breed groups that have been developed on the basis of a specific task are at least um, 3,500 years old. There's great evidence for them 1500 BC. You can look at the pyramids, you can see hunting dogs, you can see coursing dogs, you can see other kinds of protection and companion dogs. We've been developing breed groups, which are just canalized groups of genetic variation that have been developed to do certain tasks for at least 3,500 and 
probably many more years than that. Dogs are not domesticated wolves, and I want people to let go of that fallacy. If they're not wolves, they're certainly not domesticated wolves. In fact, the dog in your arms today is a domesticated dog from the ancestral dog. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll question whether this was a true domestication process rather than a coevolution process. And I'm going to argue that the data are beginning to support what years ago I thought was a wacky idea when I first said it, that we co-evolved with these individuals. And now I'm beginning to think that there may be a lot more there that we should pay attention to. So please note again that what I'm talking about is different from the way we traditionally think about domestication. Domestication traditionally involves the concept of tameness. OK, and when we talk about the wolf and fox studies, especially belly of foxes, where you had had and have because those studies are still going on in Russia, domesticated foxes, what you had was a loss of fear. You have physiological changes that in fearful or provocative situations would lower your stress response. And this is exactly what we have in horses and in cows. We didn't necessarily change the way they work, the way they think. We're taking advantage of them for what they can offer us, but we are changing that type of fearful and stress response. That's the type of domestication that people are usually talking about. With dogs, we are talking about something far more profound than that. We're talking about provocative changes in uh, I'm sorry, proactive and, and provocative, actually, changes in brain chemistry and the coding for those changes. So we've actually, um, there's research that, and I'll, I'm going to show you some, that demonstrate actual changes in genomics that parallel those of human brain genomics in a way that has been shown for no other species, and that probably goes along with the cognitive, affiliative, and cooperative work that dogs engage in with us. So this is a current biology report from 2013. I don't think the date's on this, but it's a 2013 paper, and it's out of Sweden. And one of the things that they did was they found a Siberian wolf that showed up about 35,000 years before present. And um, that wolf allowed them to, uh, it wasn't really a wolf, but it allowed them to basically pull off Arctic breeds of dogs and domestic dogs. So what they ended up with was this uh, trifurcation event where the wolves went in one direction, this odd wolf went in another direction, and you got the first dogs. And I know that they've gotten directly to boxers here. The only reason they've chosen a boxer is, don't forget, a boxer was the first uh, dog whose genome was sequenced. So it's not that all of this was pointing towards boxers, uh, but that's their prototypical quote unquote, domesticated dog in the broad sense of domestication, not that narrow calming sense uh, compared to a dingo. And so this paper, when they looked at the DNA and compared it to this ancestral wolf, they ended up with um, dogs diverging about 27,000 years ago. And the Siberian wolves contributing to um, the high latitude dog breeds that we, we now think of as Nordic or Siberian breeds. If you take a look at Peter Savalanin's work, um, he's another researcher in Sweden who has worked in genetics for many years. Um, they have been working on dogs in the Yangtze Valley and comparing them to uh, wolves and the Chinese indigenous dogs. And according to their data, and they do most of their work based on mitochondrial, not genomic DNA, uh, they had a split about 32,000 years ago where you get these true Chinese indigenous dogs. And that when that split happened, and this is the thing that's impressive, is they noticed that there's a list of genes under positive selection during that period, which overlaps extensively with positively selected genes in humans. So these are genes for complex problem solving, some types of tool use, um, changes in social order and social communication. So when you look at the changes, they first see them in digestion and metabolism, then they see them in neurological processes, and finally they see them in cancer genes, which strongly suggests that the selection pressures on dogs and humans for that period have been somewhat the same. 
And here's his branching. Here's uh, Peter Svalainen's branching that shows extant wolves and indigenous dogs using these Chinese dogs with this being about, um, as I said, 32,000 years. But what I want you to notice, and this was also in the previous paper from the other group from Sweden, I didn't point it out, but it's there. You've got selection pressure going both ways. So one of the things that very few people think about, except for people like Adam Boyko, who is at Cornell and who thinks about this a lot, um, you have wolves becoming dogs, but you also at some point have these new indigenous dogs going back and then breeding with wolves and becoming uh, a different subgroup of the wolf population. And this becomes an issue when you're looking at indigenous dogs as Adam has done. And he now does this worldwide and he, part of it's because he loves to travel. So he gets to go to these wacky places in the jungles of Brazil and Indonesia and India and look for um, native dogs, you know, dogs that may not be quite as derived as modern dogs so that we can see how similar they might be to ancestral wolf-like individuals or wolves in the area. So there's always some going back and forth, which has made the genetics of this a living hell because these are not pure populations. These are all admixed populations, which is why the type of labor-intensive work that many of these people put into it matters so much. The first paper that suggested that perhaps we had this type of selection ongoing was published in 2004, and it was out of uh, Peter Setra's group. Uh, again, this is another Swedish group. And unfortunately, he's since retired, but they um, looked at wild wolves, they looked at coyotes, and they looked at domestic dogs, and they looked at gene expression changes in the brain. And they found out that um, in wild animals, the hypothalamus, don't forget the regulatory part of your brain, is conserved in a gene expression profile, but in domestic dogs, you get real changes in neuropeptides. So you get a change in Calc B and in neuropeptide Y. And neuropeptide Y is an important neuropeptide because it's involved in anxiety, it's involved in how you think, it's involved in a whole host of things. But when they looked at hypothalamic functioning and they looked at um, neighboring regions of the brain, they found out that the rates of mutation in these genes in those regions of the brain were on the order of the rates of mutation that we saw in human brains, but have seen in no other species. Again, an argument for a type of co-evolutionary process where there is something not just deliberate going on for taming, but now we're doing collaborative work. We have to have the same types of cognitive processes. This work's being followed up by, in a paper by Robert Wayne, who frankly may be doing some of the best work in this field. and. Uh, I would totally trust his data. And Adam Boyko is also an author on this paper um, with a group, again, another Chinese group, because there are a number of Chinese indigenous dogs. And there's a big debate about whether you were north or south of the Yangtze when you developed as a wolf that became a dog. But in this case, they um, Robert has gotten very, Bob Wayne's gotten very interested in, in canine behavior and how dogs communicate with humans. Um, and they've looked at Chinese native dogs and they've looked at wolves and they have found out some really interesting patterns in candidate genes that they've looked at. And they have found that the native dogs and the German shepherds um, don't demonstrate any significant expression bias um, between them. And it indicates that these candidate genes that are expressed in the brain have quite rapidly evolved because the Chinese dogs are actually quite old. So once they split from wolves, then they began to change the expression of these genes involved in cognitive and social processes in their brains. And you don't see any divergence between modern German shepherds and these very ancient breeds today. So what we've probably had is huge amounts of artificial selection being applied by humans um, during the primary transition from wolves to very ancient dogs. And the thought that that may be consistent with then some of the changes in dog characteristics that 
then met our needs. Don't forget what I said about cats. Dogs are great foragers for scavenging. So it, the chances are dogs came and scavenged off humans. They recognized humans because they, we have uh, similar parental care. It's extended and it's extensive. Um, we do jobs. We work together. We have verbal and nonverbal communication. We live in the same types of family structures that dogs live in. It was probably a very easily recognizable system. And they have the same types of digestive enzymes that we do, unlike the adaptations that we've talked about for hypercarnivory and cats. So it is really quite different. So um, these are some of the data, and I'm just going to explain what this means rather than take you through it because we, we don't have time for that. But if you um, look at drawing C here, these are the log transform statistical significance of the expression levels for genes that show high population differentiation, higher than the genome-wide level. And what's very cool here is that you find out that what has changed in dogs are all of the parts of the brain involved in how they think and how they function. And there are also um, not a small number of retinal and olfactory bulb changes and interestingly enough, changes having to do with reproduction, which shouldn't surprise anybody because one of the things that happens even in tame foxes is that you go from breeding once a year to breeding at least two times a year. So the take home message from this study is that when they look at the outlier genes, which were expressed uh, preferentially in the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for the emotional and rational aspects of decision making, um, we see these overexpressed in these domestic dogs. They also defined highly differentiated regions between wolves and the Chinese native dogs, um, which did not differentiate, remember, from the German Shepherd domestic dogs. So between the wolves and the native dogs containing a serotonin receptor, and um, we know that this affects things about how you live with people, but it also affects social behavior and anxiety disorders. And their main conclusion was that they found that genes show population differentiation between wolves and native dogs based on genetics data in uh, brain, br I'm sorry, brain biased expression. And the transition from wolves to ancient dogs and then to modern dogs has actually changed the way dogs' brains work. And part of it was artificial selection minimally, and it's consistent with the evolution of dog specific behaviors. But the um, this is a very, he's being very conservative in his interpretation here, but we have also changed the rates of mutation in a way that they're concordant with human brain mutation. And that strongly suggests that something else may be going on. We know nothing about the feedback going the other way. We can monitor ancient wolves, ancient Chinese breeds, um, ancient other native breeds and modern dogs. We have no human outgroup to compare ourselves to. So when we say coevolution, you know, it may be something we're never truly going to be able to demonstrate except by um, inductive reasoning because we don't have anything that we can compare our rates except our ancestral rates because your DNA always leaves traces of where the mutations occurred. Okay, now that we've done the world through win through the most complex part of this, let's talk about sensitive periods. And again, remember, a sensitive period is a period when animals can best benefit from exposure to certain stimuli. Those can be social or they can be physical. And if they're deprived of such exposure, there is an increased risk of developing problems attendant with whatever that stimulus they missed was. In other words, when animals are neurodevelopmentally able to respond to stimuli, they'll benefit from exposure. If they lack exposure, they can have behavioral problems associated with the omission. Does this mean you take dogs out and you socialize them? Absolutely not. I wish people would stop using the term socialization. I wish they would stop saying, I have to take them to class to socialize them. Half the time what they're doing are taking slightly fearful dogs to classes and terrifying them. Really, what you need to do is give young dogs, as they're developing, a series of opportunities to explore those environments so that they can capitalize them when they're neurodevelopmentally ready and able to do so. And if you have a dog who doesn't seem to be able to capitalize on anything without becoming afraid, 
run that dog to the nearest veterinary behavior specialist because the earlier we intervene, the better. And I'm going to tell you what early intervention is now so that when I say it later, no one falls off their chair. I am deadly serious. I want those dogs on behavioral medication and have treated dogs as young as five weeks of age. The sooner you can get the genes in their brain regulated and producing the proteins you need, the better off these dogs are going to be. Okay. So let's discuss early neurobehavioral development in dogs. And I changed the order of these slides just a little bit. So there's an extra column in here that wasn't here for cats. You have the age and relative sensitive periods. You have the neurodevelopmental landmarks. You have the behavioral patterns that are most relevant. And then I've put in a I've changed these two columns so that this is what's relevant, this is what's going to go wrong if you miss this. So I've added sort of an extra column here. So if you look at the first two weeks of dogs' lives, they're a little behind cats. Remember, cats are developing very quickly in utero. Dogs are still maturing their cranial nerves and um, myelinating those somatosensory and motor regions of the brain. So um, you want to do a lot of gentle, tactile, gentle, emphasis on the word gentle, tactile and thermal stimulation. And if you miss this, if these dogs are orphaned and they don't get touched and they're in cold environments and they're they're underfed, um, you can get hyperreactivity and altered sensitivity to touch. Another week later, you're developing the startle reflex and you're beginning to respond to auditory stimuli. If you miss any exposure to these environments that could help you develop that auditory stimuli and that could help you realize that environments need to be differentiated so some of them may or may not be so friendly, um, you will have concerns with the visual and auditory acuity. So these are, these are big issues. Three to eight weeks, this is the first period of time that you will hear people mislabel this as socialization period. And I have to tell you that Scott and Fuller, who nailed these periods in a very small population of five breeds of dogs that were all the same shape. In other words, nobody's done small dogs, no one's done big dogs. The studies have never been repeated since the 50s and 60s. But Scott and Fuller did not call these socialization periods. They talked about socialization, but they did not label this this way. And they would be a little horrified at the way people have um, taken these periods for granted and assumed that if you expose dogs, they will turn out to be perfect. At about three weeks of age, dogs start to follow each other. This goes with the rapid myelination that you begin to see of the, the rest of the cortex going from the back um, back towards the front. Their tails start to wag at three weeks of age, and most dogs wag their tails before eight weeks of age, um, not most Visenjis, and we're gonna talk about that because it's important. I'll show you Scott and Fuller's data on tail wagging. No one's ever replicated it again, something I've tried to fund, nobody's interested in it, but it definitely, these are great studies for students to do. I know we could get them done. Um, we just have to have people willing to do it. So they'll start to wag their tail at about this time they start to follow each other, and that's when their cortex is really myelinating. Um, then they'll begin to explore and interact with other dogs. They'll eat solid food, which helps with their cortex. And they're starting to do this rough and tumble play. They'll start to identify species as early as a couple of weeks of age. This is the period of the time where if dogs never see another breed or another species, they're going to be in trouble. And this is a recognized phenomenon in urban environment. So if you live in New York City, for example, and you raise little white fluffy dogs, as it seems many people do, and you live in a high apartment building and they're trained to litter boxes, um, as in most urban areas in the world, it's a little bit of a pain in the butt to get them out to eliminate. So these dogs could easily go to someone else is home at nine to 12 weeks of age and never have seen a dog that wasn't small and fluffy and indoors. You can only imagine what a breakdown these dogs will have if they don't have that exposure. So if they don't get out and see other dogs, they'll have heightened reactivity to other dogs. They could have heightened reactivity to other species, including humans, if they don't see them. And they will have difficulty modulating their arousal levels. So this is when they're going to learn to settle or relax. And if they don't learn how to cope um, with newness, which is really what this period is about. It's about things that are new to you and how you process that information. You will forever be reactive about those subjects. 
Now, even within those periods, I just told you that no one's repeated the Scott and Fuller data, but people have begun to look at how dogs play. And this is just looking at variation between litters within breeds for three groups of dogs, Welsh Terriers, Standard Poodles, and Vichelas. Why did they pick these? Because they could. They could get people to help them out here. And if you look at it, even as young as uh, four and a half to five weeks of age, the period about which we were just talking, what you see here are very big differences in uh, how dogs play. This is the mean number of behaviors exhibited, and you see standard poodles exhibit a lot of behaviors. Vichelas exhibit uh, slightly fewer behaviors. And oddly enough, the Welsh Terrier here exhibits slightly fewer behaviors. And there is huge, and I want you to notice this, there's huge variation between the litters and Welsh Terriers. So in order for us to say anything about breeds, what this tells us is we need many, many more litters. And notice that this curve is displaced here for this period of time. Is that a seasonal effect? Was one a spring litter and one a winter one? Oh, I don't know, but I'd be very careful about how you interpret some of these data, except to say that there are differences in how these play behaviors develop. By five to seven through 12 weeks of age, you've really got frontal cortex um, being myelinated at a very rapid rate. Remember I said it goes from back to front, just like in humans. This is where you'll get true pathological fear responses. Um, and where if you don't expose dogs to other things or allow them to expose themselves, which is my preferred mode of doing it, they will develop true fear of humans and other species, true fear of approaches, and a lack of learned inhibition if they don't get to understand for elimination that there are preferred substrates. So if you raise a dog in a box, which we do in laboratory situations all the time, um, in the United States at least, not in Europe, where they actually have some welfare laws. Um, if you look at this, um, dogs at about eight and a half weeks of age are the ideal time to house train. Why? It's the first time their brain cortical development is sufficiently complex that they can recognize a place that's preferred versus a place that is not preferred or that someone doesn't prefer it and that they can use all the olfactory cues. And it's the first time they have the neuromuscular control to inhibit urination on cue. So in other words, if you said to them, oh, not there, here, wait, they, for the first time, can tighten those urinary sphincters and not leak. And that happens somewhere between seven and a half and nine weeks of age. And the reason I say eight and a half weeks of age for is the perfect time will be clear because it's also the time that most dogs are willing to start to explore environments where they will learn about preferences. If you don't let them have that, they have forever problems with learned inhibition of urine and feces. Can you still house train them? Yes. Will it be difficult? Yes. Will it be flawless? No. Okay, as you continue on in this period, uh, you'll see that by eight weeks, you've got the first time period where you're beginning to see some EEGs that match adult patterns, but not it's not an adult, a fully adult EEG. And when you look at all of this um, and you look at when mom weans dogs, by seven weeks, the dogs that Scott and Fuller studied it all naturally weaned their pups, German Shepherd studies, Belgian Malinois studies, studies for which we have enough data, strongly suggest that that's a week by which even the, the slowest dog is usually weaned. But they would choose to remain with them through 10 weeks of age if they could. Why? Because they're teaching them social skills. Okay, most of your parents, as much as they would probably have liked to have done it at some point, didn't abandon you at the ages of 5, 8, 10, 12, or 14, um, because we need that social development. We need those social skills. We need to learn to think critically, and so do dogs. So probably the earliest age at which a dog can or should be sold is eight and a half weeks, and in fact, possibly a little longer. And I want people to think about that because that's a very, very, very different way of looking at the world. Um, dogs who are kept in one environment from uh, 14 to 20 weeks of age, and Scott and Fuller did this with a subset of their dogs, won't leave. You no longer need fences. You no longer need cages. You don't need locks on the doors. They're not going anywhere. Why? 
because they've never learned they can go anywhere. So this is the period where they're starting their um, pruning and neurogenesis. The pruning is still very low. That won't kick into high gear into social maturity, but they're rapidly building neurons. And if they never learn anything new, if they never learn to experience something and to make a mistake, and I have to tell you that so much play is about learning to make a mistake successfully. Why do you keep these pups with mom and their siblings? So that they can fail successfully, so they can recover from an error. And if you don't allow them to do that by not allowing them to explore new environments and being there to pick them up when they fail, they won't do so. And what you tend to get is a complete lack of plasticity and response that's characteristic of normal behaviors. And I tend to see a number of patients who are breeders from puppy mills who've been rescued or adopted. And these poor dogs never saw anything but the inside of their breeding run. And for them to be in the world is terrifying. Um, we can help them. They have to have restricted protective environments with time and love and drugs and diet and lots of work. They come along and have the best life they can have. I don't think any dog ever wishes suicide on itself. So we do have to protect these dogs. It's not to say that you can't have them, but I want people to appreciate what you've done to their brains. Um, it ought to be illegal. Um, and it's not. Okay, epigenetic effects on early development with dogs can be profound, the same as they can with cats. And let me review what epigenetics is. Remember, this is what happens when you have a glucocorticoid excess pre, peri, and postnatally, and what happens with molecular learning at the cellular level. Um, a large amount of chronic glucocoid exposure at this period uh, structurally delays hippocampal development. So you get a smaller, less functional, more reactive hippocampus. Remember that cortisol itself also acts as a hormone response element. It interferes with the acquisition and consolidation of tax learning. Now, you've already got a shrunken hippocampus. So you don't have a whole lot of stuff to work with for this task learning. But hormone response elements are now going to stop what you could have learned. And we know from rats that if you have this ongoing stress and glucocorticoid exposure, you have lower levels of extinction of Q condition fear, shrinkage of the hippocampus and memory impairment, facilitation of fear conditioning in the amygdala because you get a much more reactive amygdala, particularly with auditory fear conditioning. And pay attention, this is one of the big problems with dogs that are shipped early in airplanes and puppy mill dogs. Puppy mills are noisy places. Dogs should be raised in much quieter environments. Um, when you ship them by plane, there are huge noise variations at a time when they are very sensitive to it. And these are concerns. These are welfare concerns. Concerns. And we know that in some genetic variations, you can survive pretty much, in some genetic backgrounds, you can survive pretty much anything, and in some, you're much more at risk. Again, um, frontal cortex, amygdala at the end of the hippocampus, paired hippocampal structures, paired caudate nuclei, generally involved in OCD, which we're not going to talk about. And what ends up by happening is, you know, you get a whole bunch of environmental inputs. They stimulate proteins, proteins stimulate transcription factors. You go along to the coding regions of the gene, then you have mRNA making this into protein that's then translated into functional aspects of the cell, and that gives you your phenotype. So you're coming along and you're translating this protein and you're trying to learn and you're trying to learn and you have CFOS and CREB and CFOS and CREB and CFOS and CREB and you're trying to learn and you're trying to learn and oops, there it is. There's your glucocorticoid effect in terms of there's your glucocorticoid receptor and a hormone response element in the form of cortisol comes up and aborts your learning. So let me show you an example from a recent paper that was published in JAMA Psychiatry that's actually quite nice because it's got great graphics. Um, this is what happens in rats, and there is no reason to assume that this doesn't happen in dogs. We know a similar thing happens in humans. I would love to see this study funded and redone in dogs, and again, have not been quite able to fund it, although we have a a grant pending for something similar. Um, if you look at maternal grooming in mice, 
you've got high maternal grooming lines and low maternal grooming lines. And if you've got a high maternal grooming line and you've got a stressor, what happens with stressors is you tag on methylated groups to the promoter regions of your DNA, which means you don't start this transcription properly. In um, a high grooming line, you tack on a few of these methylated groups, but you can still activate the transcription. And then when you get down here, if you look at this, you have normal hippocampal um, glucocorticoid expression where you get a lot of glucocorticoid receptors going. In a low maternal grooming line, you have persistent hypermethylation. So here they've modulated the methylation by demethylation. Here with a chronic glucocorticoid excess, you get persistent hypermethylation. So now you've got methylation everywhere in the promoter region. You, you've lost your neurotrophic growth factor here, so it doesn't bind well. So you don't actually transcribe this well. So you actually don't make normal or enough glucocorticoid receptors. Okay, what now happens when you're stressed? So in a high maternal grooming line where you've got lots of glucocorticoid receptors, you have a stress response, the HPA axis gets activated, you put out glucocorticoids like crazy, they, the receptors recognize them and it says, okay, I recognize them. I can turn off this response and you've still got a few bits of glucocorticoids floating around, but you're pretty normal. Okay, what happens here with a low maternal grooming line? Now, don't forget, that's just a model for you didn't have everything that you needed as babies. And there are low genetic grooming lines. And I'm sure there are low genetic grooming lines in dogs too. And we haven't looked for them. But this is used as a model for early deprivation. Well, remember here that you never really methylated. You had a hypermethylization response. You never really translated those proteins normally. You have a big stress response. You've got glucocorticoids everywhere, but your receptors can't do anything with them. So you have a decreased inhibition of this response with lots of glucocorticoids floating around and you're chronically stressed. And now you can't learn because that process with the amygdala and the hippocampus continues. Okay, that's what happens in puppy mill dogs. That's what happens in early orphaned dogs. And may the gods forgive, you are separated from mom too early and you don't have enough food either in utero or in nursing or post-separation. Here's that corticosteroid loop, okay? And now you see it magnified in separation so that you've got this whole glucocorticoid loop cutting directly to being self-fulfilling, okay? Now what happens with food deprivation, what no one tells you is ghrelin, a hormone that tells you about society, never turns off. You've got neuropeptide Y that then stimulates AVP, and you now stimulate this whole loop through a second pathway. And this is what you see in having two puppy mill dogs in my household. I can tell you that this is what you see in households where dogs are um, chronically food deprived as puppies. And they may be growly and care very much about food. You can overcome this, but it certainly makes their stress response, especially in the presence of food, much greater. Okay, let's talk about the effects of age on separation for dogs. These are some epigenetic effects. Um, this is a paper by Pierre Antoni et al. that looked at separating dogs from their litters at 30 to 40 days versus dogs that had been taken at two months of age. So you're off by a couple of weeks, okay? So these are the early separated dogs, the late separated dogs. This is the eight to eight and a half weeks of age. This is the five to six weeks of age. They compared two groups of 70 dogs each as adults. And they found out that the dogs that were separated early statistically were far more reactive to noises and they did more attention seeking behavior. They had many more reported behaviors, but um, the statistically significant ones were the reactivity to noise and the attention seeking. So this is really strong evidence that dogs shouldn't be separated from their litters or the influence of their dam, nor adopted into a new home before eight weeks of age. The same group or overlapping groups also looked at the source of the dog. In other words, is this a homebred dog or a pet store dog, which is relevant for, for what happens in the United States and to a lesser extent in Canada and other parts of the world. And in the puppy store sold dogs, so the dogs that went to a store from a home 
because this study was done in Italy. So there are not puppy mills per se, but people will sell their puppies to stores. So just the effect of being sold to a store, you had a, an odds ratio of uh, 5.6 times greater chance of body licking, three times greater chance of house soiling, 2.4 greater chance of any kind of aggression directed to owners and uh, a two times chance of separation related behaviors compared to dogs that were not put in a store at any point in time. Okay, the take home message should be here and Frank McMillan has done a great job of reviewing it in this um, paper in the journal that I edit, which is a review paper where he basically talks about the fact that increased fear is identified as a response to unfamiliar people, children, other dogs, non-social fear, um, and when taken on walks, in addition to these other factors due to not just genetics, but early life stress, the deprivation, the early weaning and the maternal separation, transport, pet store related factors and owner factors. Guys, we have control over all of this. We can fix all of this. We just have to do what's best for the dog. We can even do some very clever things with genetics by doing genetic studies and deciding who breeds the best pets. But certainly this early stress and this feeding and the pet stores, we can fix all of this. And in fact, he cites some data that looks at Jack Russell's pugs and chihuahuas and looks at whether the risks are um, increased or decreased for different frequencies of behaviors. And Jack Russell's, uh, who came from very responsible breeders who did everything versus less responsible breeders who did nothing, um, weren't even as trainable. And Jack Russell's are pretty resilient little dogs. So you tended to get all the complaints that people bring pets to veterinary behaviorists for if you did not have a responsible breeder who understood this. So there's an excellent case against very early adoption. The data argue for having pups stay with the mother and siblings through at least eight to nine weeks of age in a safe, complex physical and social environment. The people who are then caretaking the pups will start to have to house train them. And in some cases, it may be preferable to keep pups through 12 weeks of age. The story is the same as for the kittens. I know they won't be cute then, but their mental health might be better. Okay, let me see a few, say a few things about um, breed and temperament before we move on to what we can do. Um, again, we've talked about temperament last week where we talked about stable dis disposition traits. Um, we've talked about a variety of temperaments which have become behavioral polymorphisms. And the reason people have talked about temperament in terms of shy or bold is people are looking to see what's heritable. Well, after looking at 35 years of data on his Swedish military dogs, Eric Wilson ran all those 30 years of data. They have a database that exceeds 100,000 dogs who have all been tested in the same way. And Eric's conclusion, which is coming out in a series of papers, is actually sort of shocking that the behavioral variation in these dogs, at most, he could attribute 30% of it to genetics. The rest was what they ate, who they saw, what they did, who trained them. That's very different than the, the perception most people have. And I wanna make sure you understand it's different than a breed liability. So in other words, if you have a couple of genes or a set of genes or one gene that begins to go wrong and you're breeding a specific breed, you can spread that through family lines quite quickly and that can be a breed liability. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about range of complex behavioral traits and without selecting for them deliberately or accidentally what that range does. And at most, they could attribute only 30% of the behaviors to the genetics model. But we do see those perceptions and they are real that you can do certain things better. And I'm just going to show you some pictures of some working dogs. This is a patrol and attack dog from the Australian Air Force at a working dog meeting. I do a lot of work with working dogs, so I'm at working dog meetings. This is a German Shepherd. Notice that this is a small German Shepherd. She, this is a she, does not look like most show German shepherds. But the reason for that is this is what she has 
has to do. And you'll see she has to have great hips. She has to get up on somebody. The only reason she's on a lead is there are spectators. It's for everybody's safety so that no one acts squirrely. And the dog immediately has to turn that off. And look at the fact that this dog, although she is not growling, snarling, or lunging at anybody, hasn't completely turned it off. Look at her ears. She is still in work mode. And she's a tiny German Shepherd, but she has to be swung around by the person she grabs. Can you select for that? Well, if you do a good job and you get good dogs, about 30% of that will be genetics and the rest will be the dog's inclination, the individual dog and how well you can work with that. This is an Australian customs dog. This is dog is actually only five and a half months old, started in a program, raised from parents who work. You can already see the behaviors that have been selected for that sniffing and that exploring. The dog gets his scented towel when he finds what he's got, told that the dog is just brilliant, raised from a very early age. So here you've got early enrichment. You've got genes that are helping you out. You've got dogs doing a task that those dogs were asked to do, which was use their nose. And you have a better chance of everything going in the right direction. But when we talk about genetics, remember that there is always a distribution. And this is just out of Falconer's quantitative genetics book to show you that you can get um, any trait. You know, this is how big the rodent is, the litter size, the number of facets on a Drosophila, the number of, of bristles on a Drosophila. But I want to point out something to you that people forget. They think that they are selecting for a continuum of behavioral traits, and that may not be what you get in these puppies. This is a base population of Drosophila, and they selected, and it's something um, that they selected for that doesn't have any meaning for us. It's bristle number. But they selected for Drosophila with loads of bristles and very few bristles after 35 and 34 generations of selection. This is only broadly a normal distribution. But what I want you to notice is there is no longer any overlap between the resultant populations and the parental population. You may only see this variation, but by selecting on this, continuously for 34 generations, you got that. That's the stuff that's hidden in the genome that only selection studies can bring out. And this is why when people say, but it's a German Shepherd. I've had German Shepherds from this breeder for years. This dog is different. You look at them and say, but of course this dog is different. These things happen. Okay, I said we'd talk about Scott and Fuller's tail wagging to show you a trait that could be under selection. He looked at Basenjis, Beagles, Cockers, Shelties, and Fox Terriers, and he had a group of a lot of people. There were dozens and dozens of people working on this long-term study. These dogs are all the same shape and size. That was deliberate. Um, and they look at the first day of tail wagging, which is important for communication and signaling. And you'll notice that Cocker Spaniels and Shelties came in really early. Fox Terriers followed, Beagles next. Whoa, first day, 28. That's 11 days, almost two weeks later than some of the other breeds. Median, take a look at the difference in these medians, guys. Those are huge. Now look at the last day observed. Well, for Shelties and Cocker Spaniels, the last day observed was just a month or a little over it three months for Basenjis. We have not selected all breeds to signal in the same way. And we need to be mindful of what is normal for the breed and how that changes with generations because the dog you have now, you may have had Australian Shepherds your whole life, but the dog you have now is not the Aussie you had as a kid because in 35 years, that's 35 generations at least 35 generations of selection. And these are the types of things that can happen when you choose breeds. And this is the type of stuff we need to know to really understand behavior. And if we really want to understand how much behavior is genetic and how much is environmental, we really need to understand behavioral response surfaces across times and conditions. And this is what would help us select puppies that were very stable. What do we mean by a response surface? We mean this. So here's your behavioral trait. Here's your genetics trait. Here's your environmental effect. If you're individual A, it doesn't matter what we do to you in terms of the environment. You're rock solid. But 
if you're individual B, C, or D, you are not rock solid. The environment matters to you a lot. And depending on what we do, you can look like A or you can look like a truck wreck. So this is the dog who had epigenetic effects and ends up in the great home. This is the dog who had epigenetic effects and gets to be a breeder in a puppy mill. We have a role to play here, and we will never achieve the welfare status we need if we don't actually collect and publish the data. And to do that, we need to do the studies and we need to get the funding for the studies. Because otherwise you end up with dogs like were shown in Martin Godbaugh's research for his residency. They found out that they had a bunch of outliers as eight to 12 week old puppies. They had a standardized veterinary exam that they subjected these puppies to. And they had dogs that at eight to 12 weeks who were just terrified, two standard deviations away from everybody else. Well, their subsequent research found out that those dogs were still terrified at 18 months of age. So there was the case where they had, they were uninfluenced by the environment. They were in humane environments, but could have been influenced by having their functional genetics change by medication because the medications we use now change things like protein kinases and it's just applied in vivo gene therapy. You're just changing how you learn. The boldness shyness uh, concept really came about in working dogs, as I've already discussed. It was hinted at by Scott and Fuller, but Kent Svartberg looked at thousands and thousands of working dogs and found out there were outgoing ones, which they chose to call bold, and that there were more withdrawn or um, shy ones, which they ended up calling shy, and they could include fearful in that. Paul McGreevy has applied this concept to breed groups, and you've got to be a little careful because not all individuals in the breed are the same. But if you think about working dogs and boldness, the same things you select for, that outgoing nature, that curiosity, that resilience in the face of trauma, is what you select for in breeds. So when they looked at, at many of these breeds, they found out that herding and gun dogs were relatively bold, and they changed the herding dog groups depended change depended on whether they headed dogs or they healed dogs. And certainly these dogs were bolder than you might expect some pet dogs to, to be. So you can use this concept to sort of qualify dogs, but remember it, these are broad brush strokes. Um, when people have looked a little more closely, you can see how the shyness boldness concept may factor into fear-related avoidance in puppies. And in fact, this group looked at Cavalier, King Charles, German Shepherd puppies, and Yorkshire Terrier puppies. And they found that when you looked at dogs that exhibited fear in their research situation, which is a very simple research design that anybody could replicate, they did a great job of providing you with a roadmap to how to do that. They found out that calves were more fearful than um, that the Yorkies were more fearful than calves, calves were more fearful than shepherds. And they found out that Cavalier um, puppies demonstrated more fear related avoidance behaviors associated with a cortisol response than did anything else. Well, you might expect this. You could say, look, um, this is what you would expect from little dogs who were lap dogs, but there are some very bold dogs out there. But what's interesting to me is that we see both the cortisol and the behavioral effect on a breed-based basis. And I think that if we're going to start to do these studies and listen carefully, because what I'm about to say will not make a lot of people happy, we need to start considering that we might be selecting for pathological behaviors. And unless we have a good way to quantify these across dogs, we'll never know. Um, certainly, we see that dogs, as they age, as they begin to move through um, social maturity, they can have very different effects on how they work. And that was the original work that Naomi Harvey and her group uh, and Lucy Asher and their group with Guide Dogs for the Blind had done. But one of the things they found out in their early studies was that when they looked at environmental variables in behavior scores, um, who was raising their puppy mattered. So in other words, even when you've got these young dogs 
where they are not socially mature, the rate at which they'll approach social maturity, the rate at which their behaviors will become more stable depends on how they're raised. Which goes back to Eric Wilson's, only 30% of this is genetic in the end. Okay, we've talked about social maturity. I'm going to talk about social maturity, and then I'm going to talk about intervention, and we'll wrap up. Remember, as you approach social maturity, you have renewed growth with progressive myelination, but for the first time, you're getting really regressive pruning. You've got too many neurons, so you're really pruning these. We see this begin to start to happen where the cerebral gray matter in humans begins to shrink at 16 to 17 years of age. You get more connections between the frontal and temporal lobes. This continues through social maturity, which goes through the late 20s. It starts in the late teens and goes through the mid 20s for girls, starts in the late teens to early 20s for men, and many people still hadn't finished pruning their neurons when they truncated the study at a 27-year group for the males. They needed groups in the 30s that they didn't have. But what you've got in social maturity is a change in the maturation of the frontal cortex and the, the corpus callosum that allows you to process information more quickly, more accurately, to share that information between the hemispheres and trauma affects how you do this. So you can't prune cells well, you don't myelinate well if you have had early trauma. So this is all tied together from the beginning to the end. This is all part of a loop. In dogs, we think they start this as early as 10 months of age and may not finish it to 12 to 36 months of age. Some of the large breed people say their dogs are very slow to mature. We have no comparable data. But I will tell you that, they're, um, that dogs who work do not enter training programs until at least 12 months and generally 18 to 24 months of age. By then, their behavior is pretty stable. Um, as I said, it's never been well measured physiologically or behaviorally, but we should expect that the imaging studies, if they're ever done, and the physiology studies will be very similar to that of humans. And there are some behavioral data that suggests this. This is a paper that was published a while ago on reactivity in dogs. And these are working dogs. These are puppies that were being bred to be working dogs. And they had some dogs they discarded and some dogs they kept. And they had a series of 15 tests. They were able to group them into different groups. But the amazing thing is that they could track that all dogs became more confident between five and nine months of age when they're doing the corpus callosum structuring and they're um, myelinating more of the cortex. And between nine and 24 months of age, exactly the period we postulate for social maturity, they developed an increase in problem-solving behavior, attentiveness, and what they called self-confidence. And certainly at 18 to 24 months of age, they could choose which dogs they were going to train. Okay, let me say a few things about minimizing risk. We've already hinted at this with the cat stuff. We've already hinted at it with the dog stuff. Early intervention postnatally and for puppies means that you need to protect their brains. DHA and EPA, the polyunsaturated fatty acids or their precursors, are absolutely critical to constituent neuronal development in dogs. Um, physical stimulation that promotes dogs to act in a calm manner is absolutely critical. Mental stimulation is critical. Exercise to develop coordination, which they will get on their own if you allow them to do so, is absolutely critical, preferably paired with normal or supranormal dogs. So dogs do observational learning. We don't have time to talk about that today, but it's really important. And medication, if they are troubled, if they were deprived, medication as early as possible to stimulate these neurotrophic factors because it's this protein kinase system you have to get going. And this picture is here to remind me to tell you, you can do this through olfactory learning. This doesn't have to be problem solving. That's the problem solving you do. It can be olfactory learning. You just have to get these dogs to do it. And the reason I say DHA is important is not only are there great rodent studies on DHA and EPA and how they buffer the brain against um, neuronal assault, but in the study that Steve Zicker who works for Hills, um, did on cognitive learning, memory, and immune function. High DHA diets across the board had better learning. Moderate diets helped with short-term learning, but 
if you were on a high DHA diet, you developed an immune response earlier and better than dogs on moderate to low DHA diets, which strongly suggests that this would be constituent in foods that dogs would bring to other dogs. But if you're in a puppy mill or you're in a bad situation, your chances are you're in a deprived diet and you've already done damage to your brain. So in order to keep brains healthy, we have to assess the effects of stress and trauma, treat early and often, and enhance their cognitive stimulation. You can do this. This is uh, one of my dogs, Toby, when he was nine and a half weeks of age, and I was just gently rolling him and rolling and rolling him on my on his back in my lap and rubbing his belly and he did this every day he had every part of his body massaged and this is sort of the first time we tried it and then within three minutes he was this calm toby was a super normal dog as a puppy and as an adult but gentle massage stimulating he was never afraid he was always nestled he was always cuddled and we can do some other things. I'm going to show you a couple of videos of things you can do. This is one of my dogs, and we dearly hope that um, these, these videos work. So this is Missy Rose, and this dog is just following a toy. This is just showing you how important attentional focus is. So let's get the video going. I am slowly moving a toy back and forth. Why are we doing this? We did this as part of a cognitive task that we subjected a few hundred dogs to over a few years for which we're still analyzing the data. Dogs who could not do this were all hyper-reactive. So I now have people who have reactive dogs who are of puppies who were deprived, slowly teach them to follow an object. And you can see that she's doing this beautifully. She tracks it up and down. She tracks it back and forth. We've asked her to sit to be very calm, just to look up and down, move around, just track that toy and be calm. And then she's told she's a brilliant dog because believe it or not, that dog is not usually that calm. Okay, the other thing you can teach dogs is a form of relaxation in terms of deep breathing. And this is actually a cognitive focus and cognitive enhancement tool that's used in humans. But there are a couple of tricks to using it in dogs. Dogs can't pat and sniff at the same time. They can learn to monitor a hand holding a treat. They'll track an odor back to its source. Dogs who are able to look at your face, like Missy Rose was able to look at me and then look at the toy, will get more accurate information from your face. And there are great papers on that now, thanks to Julian Kaminsky. And they'll trust you if the signals are congruent. They'll learn if the signals aren't congruent and you're lying. And if they can take a deep breath, and this is the key part, they can get control over their own sympathetic branch of their unconscious or autonomic nervous system. And they can learn to manage a threat. So they can change their increased heart rate, their increased vigilance, their increased panting. Dogs already know that threatening doesn't feel good. They can learn operant conditioning, but what we're doing here is cognitive therapy. We need to do the biofeedback part that gives them the cognitive control, learning that they have the power to do this, that when they take a deep breath, their heart rate will decrease, that they can feel that and they will feel better. We teach all my clients this. Do all of them get it? No. Could all of their dogs get it? Yes. Do most of the dogs get it? Actually, yes, despite the clients many times. So we start by getting the dog to attend to treats. I do this in an absolutely quiet environment. I don't use words at first. I couple the treat to my hand. I get them to look at me. I get them to relax their jaw. I get them to hold their breath and not lick their lips. And then I can couple that with sit or lie down, whatever's most comfortable for the dog, and breathing deeply. So here I am with Pick, my Mr. Picasso. So Picasso looks at me. I've got the treat by my eye. He looks. I start to bring the treat closer to his mouth. He's really focusing on it. I bring it right before his nose. Notice he closes his mouth. I hold it right in front of his nostrils. You can see that he's opened his nostrils as he takes a deep breath. And then when he closes his mouth and his nostrils are as round as they can get and his chest isn't moving, I give him the treat. So let's watch him actually do this.
and I wait for the maximum inhalation. And when he's holding his breath, and I give him the treat. And he's a brilliant boy. And he's really, really good at this. Okay. We'll go down to Linus. We're giving you the easy dogs with pink noses first. And Linus isn't quite as good at it. He flickers a little bit, but you'll see right now he's gonna do it flawlessly. And you can see his chest isn't moving. Perfect. The lovely Missy Rose. So she's holding that breath. And I want to make sure she takes a deep breath. Good girl. Good girl. Perfect. And then we'll see Toby do it. And at first, Toby cheats. Toby's like, you have a treat. I'll wiggle my nose. And I'm like, uh, no. He says, oh, you really wanted me to hold my breath. Yes. Well, I think I can do that. And you'll see him do it brilliantly. There it is. He can do deep, deep, deep breaths. Yes, deep breath. And I wanted that deep breath, so I only rewarded that deep breath. And here you see a dog that was taught by someone in one of the courses I taught. And this is his own dog. And he goes home and he teaches this dog to do it. <laughs> it's what happens when you make your own videos. OK, so what can happen if we fail to do this? Well, you're expecting me to tell you that if we don't feed animals, they'll have more obsessive compulsive behaviors. They'll have more aggression if we don't house them at the right time. That's not what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you that if you don't stimulate animals' brains throughout their life, they don't age well. And that the hippocampus shows a significant loss of neuron in brains of older dogs compared to young dogs, unless they are behaviorally enriched. If you behaviorally enrich dogs throughout their life, they have more hippocampal neurons than dogs that were not behaviorally enriched. And let me tell you something. We specialize as humans in turning off dogs' brains. Dogs aren't meeting one-tenth of what they could be because we don't believe they're cognitive and that is completely wrong. And we owe it to these guys to give them the type of cognitive life that evolution tells us we could. That life where they've mutated genes that are involved in social signaling at the same rate humans were. We need to meet these dogs' needs. And there are some ways to do it. We make very similar recommendations in the AHA guidelines to the ones I'm going to make here. If you have a stressed pup, obviously protect the pup from triggers. Give him PUFAs up to 2,000 milligrams per day of the DHA and EPA. Excellent diets three times a day. Expect heightened reactivity around food for the reasons we said, but you can overcome it if they learn that food is never going to be missing from their lives and you can teach them to self-calm. Meds is needed and early, I'm not kidding, five weeks of age, not too early for me. I've done as early as three. Attentional and calming exercises, early problem solving, and gradual exposure at that dog's rate that emphasizes control and predictability. For non-stressed pups, excellent diet with PUFAs and feed them three times a day. Introductions at their pace, they'll tell you what they are clearly. Early cognitive enhancement, and ongoing cognitive enhancement, all pups should be assessed every three months for the first two to three years of their life for behavioral development. Do we know what normal is? No. Before I die, would I like to have published what I think normal is? Yes. Um, have adequate expectations of the breed, of familial behaviors, of client expectations, and the needs and roles for environmental stimuli. And have the clients have this. You know, your job is to help them understand what could happen, not what they think should happen. Okay, here's a fun fact to know and tell. Age match military working dogs who are deployed and actively work live longer than those who aren't deployed and who are kenneled. So that brain stimulation matters. This is a Belgian Malinois who has just told his handler where the landmine is. Okay, so 
there is a situation where no child will lose her leg. And if you do all the right stuff, you'll be lucky and you'll end up with dogs who actually jump for joy. Um, my email addresses, you have them in both places. The journal that I edit, you can join one of the organizations and get it included in your membership that are listed on the journal. And uh, every year with Kirsty Sexel and Sarah Bennett this year, we teach a week-long course for veterinarians at the NAVC Institute. With permission, we allow vet students to take it and we have also allowed veterinary nurses um, to usually come with the vets they work for. It's a, a week-long intensive course, 10 to 12 hours a day, uh, best teaching experience I've had and generally the best educational experience those taking it have had. So if you want more information, the website is there. And I'd like to thank Alice. I'm a few minutes over and I apologize. Um, we have a couple of questions, Karen. Yep. Um, so one of them was, this was fairly early on about the developmental stages. Um, would you th look at them any differently if you're training a therapy or service dog? Oh, this is a great question. Would you look at these developmental stages any differently if you were training a therapy or service dog? Well, based on what, um, if you were, okay, not if you were training, but if you were breeding. If you were breeding, therapy or service dogs, and you look at those developmental phases based on what um, that study of fear behavior showed you is that there may be breed and litter associated responses. So you could probably over generations select for dogs who were better able to do this and do this earlier. And that's what you saw in the study from Guide Dogs for the Blind, where they ended up by being able to tell which dogs wouldn't make it by eight months of age, but they detected a huge foster parent effect for that. So um, you could shift those periods a little bit. Now, if you are going to have a therapy or service dog and you know that, let me give you a piece of advice having raised these myself and having been involved with a number of these organizations. The more proactive, non-fearful stimulation you can give them, these dogs are going to have to do more. They need more. And you're going to have to give that to them as early as they can. And in fact, the service dog organizations that foster out their dogs will tell you that if they had a choice, they would have their handlers develop those dogs, but they can't afford it. And in the case of the Swedish military, where many dogs get returned early by nine or 10 months of age because they've destroyed people's houses, those dogs who then come back and live with the handlers because they're old enough now at nine to 10 months of age, they're willing to take them back into the kennel and they'll have a handler and trainer attached to them immediately. Those dogs do brilliantly because the reason they're destroying is they don't have an outlet for all that creative thought. You know, these are the very bold dogs. These are the super normal dogs. These are the dogs who need that enrichment to be able to not feel trapped. And those dogs can make some of the best working dogs. Be aware. Those are the dogs that are not for everybody as a service or working dog. Those are the dogs that not everybody who is blind or in a wheelchair will be able to handle. Okay, here's another question. Sometimes clients will ask what the best signs are to look for when choosing a puppy from a litter. What is your view on this? Well, you know, somebody once said to me about what I do for a living, people want pets, they don't want projects. And of course, every single patient I touch is a project. So I would ask what you want in your dog. And if you just want a pet and um, you don't care if the dog might be a little shy, then there aren't concerns. But if you want a dog who is not shy, you should select for a dog that is not shy. Don't rescue something because you feel sorry for it unless you're up for the task. I will tell you that, that, that if you do rescue that dog and you are up for it, helping that dog will make you into a far better human being than you could have been. And you'll learn things and go to places you would never have gone. But ask yourself what you want. Do you want that bold dog? Do you really want the boldest dog in the litter? Do you want the dog that is still playing at 10 o'clock at night when all the other puppies are asleep? Those are accurate indicators 
not of the adult you'll have. They're accurate indicators of the puppy you'll raise. Which puppy can you raise well? And don't just count on a one-time visit. You should see those pups at various times a day during various periods. And good breeders are now catching on to this and videotaping these things. So choose the dog you think you can raise. Because the dog whose neurons are pruned in social maturity may not be that same dog. But if you can raise it, you will have developed the bond that chances are the dog will be able to take you where that dog needs to go. Okay, here's another question. Um, what age did you say most working dogs don't start training until um, in relation to social maturity? Yeah, they don't start training. It is, training's expensive. Um, you have to understand that part of this is the economics of it. So a dog that is going to fall apart at 15 months of age when they prune their neurons. You remember, when you do neuronal pruning, this is when we see psychiatric conditions develop in dogs, humans, and cats. A dog who is going to prune its neurons at 15 months of age and looked great at 12 months, but still isn't through social maturity and is going to fall apart is an expensive training failure if you started him at 12 months of age. So most people don't start them until about 18 months of age. Some people will take them in as early as 12 months of age knowing they'll have a bigger failure rate. Um, if you've got a particularly stable population or good ways of assessing them, what guide dogs for the blind found in that study and what the Swedish military dogs have found is that they can at least make a mistake on one side at eight to nine months of age. In the guide dog study, by eight months of age, if that dog can't do certain things when they bring it in for a test, they know the dog will fail. That doesn't mean the remaining 70% of the dogs will succeed, but they don't bother training any of the ones that will fail. By 24 months of age, the dog you see is the dog you get. Now, in an ideal world, you would have been training that dog a lot earlier, which is why you see most organizations entering these dogs into training between 12 and 18 months of age, because they don't want to miss that phase where they can do the training. But you're only as good as the people who train you and understand you as a dog. So it goes all ways. And I think that that matters. But you're, you're waiting for that 12 to 18 month window. Um, okay, would you suggest certain breeds over others for a service dog? And does it depend on the person's needs? Uh, the answer is yes and yes. It definitely depends on everybody's needs and it depends on what you want for them to do. One of the things that that McGreevy study showed when they looked at boldness in breeds is that even in herding dogs, there are differences in how you understand boldness depending on what the individual's dog tasks is. Dogs who give eye, like border collies, are considered less bold in their scaling system than things like Kelpies and Australian Shepherds who sort of give eye and then go grab you. Um, they're not for everybody. So you have to ask yourself what you want. The reason people selected shepherds to begin with, and, and a little history here will help, we didn't have service dogs until we saw the horrendous injuries that the First World War, the Great War, the war supposedly to end all wars, we wish, um, occurred. Now, many of the dogs that worked um, it, for the military and had worked as far back as the 1800s in wars as couriers and things, were mixed breeds um, of shepherds. And certainly some of the first trained dogs were shepherds because they were at that point working dogs. The historicity of having German shepherds as working dogs is rooted in something that's well over 100 years old right now. And those were dogs that were also being handled by men who had just come out of a grueling military situation. So these were all young men. They were all fit. They could all handle a big dog. The world has changed. German shepherds have changed. What you need, and this is why, for example, um, Guide Dogs for the Blind in California has had the most success with a hybrid. What you need is a dog your client population can handle and can do the job. And their most successful dogs right at this point in time are a cross between Goldens and Labradors. Um, for the types of dogs that their client population needs, that works very well for them. 
What you need to have regardless is a very good quantitative geneticist, a very good molecular geneticist, and a very good behavior person working for you. And very few of these places have all three of those. So, you know, it's somewhat subjective, but um, ask yourself, you know, smart dogs, what do you want them to do? If the dog is going to pick people up or physically move them around, the dog has to be of a decent size. If the dog's going to be a hearing dog, it doesn't really matter what size the dog is. And if the dog has to sit with someone in a wheelchair, the German Shepherds aren't going to work for you. Okay. Uh, and there's one, this looks like the last question. It's a kind of a big question. How would you approach educating society on the stigma around pit bulls that it considers pit bulls, you know, as dangerous? Oh, <laughs> timely question. Since um, I have a letter coming out in the next issue of JAVMA on exactly this issue with Tini de Coyster. I've been spending much of the last 20 years of my life trying to educate society. And, you know, here's something that you need to think about. It's not the high note I would like to end this seminar on, but um, humans are superstitious. Okay, we are fickle. We like myth. We like just so stories. We like things tied up with bows. We would rather believe something we really want to believe than something that's true. We deny illness. We deny aging. We deny death. So data are a hard sell. Okay, um, data itself hasn't done it. But what I would remind people is that ignorance is far worse. And the data here that can help us the most are the data that show that in no country where a breed ban has been enacted have there been fewer bites. That's because the vast majority of most dogs, period, don't bite people. You would rather know who's going to bite. I know my patients will bite. My clients have no illusions. They take every every action they can to get that dog better and to prevent a bite. And if they don't do so, they know they're going to be liable for that and that the dog will suffer. So what we have to realize is that if people aren't going to be responsible and they think that pathological behaviors are sexy, which is what YouTube will tell you if you spend any time on it at all, and they think it's okay for dogs to do these things, and they don't care about the welfare of dogs, we will have the status quo no matter what breed ban you enact. It will just be a different breed that they're going to ban. So for this to happen, we have to realize that the dogs who bite belong to a subset of people that data are beginning to show us may be less responsible and may in fact even not have the social stability necessary to perhaps raise and handle these dogs. Um, people who are pathological with people will be pathological with dogs. So we need really to have a one health approach to this where every pediatrician tells every parent about the data and the accurate information about dogs and kids. And every veterinarian tells every parent accurate information about dogs and kids. And we register and report dogs and we have assays and we encourage good behavior and we fund the research that tells us how to get there. And that's a lot of work, but that's what's needed. Because otherwise, all you're doing is breedism. And, you know, as the Brits are fond of saying, punish the deed, not the breed. But if we, all we're going to do is punish, we're never going to fix this problem. Okay, Karen, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to everybody who's been listening. Um, join us next Tuesday for the final webinar in the series on emergent data in behavioral medicine, 20 findings that will change the way you think and practice. And once again, I thank Karen from, from Pennsylvania and me <laughs> signing out from Prince Edward Island. Thank you, Alice. It was loads of fun as usual. Great questions. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I'm closing it off now. Bye. Bye.